Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Company of Heroes Map Making 101 series. My name is John. I am one of the community managers on the team, uh, and I am joined by our map designer, Will. Will, can you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, yep. Yeah, uh, my name is Will. I am currently the multiplayer map designer on Company of Heroes 3. You may know me previously as Monolithic Bacon. I was a community mapper for Co1 and Co2. So, Will, uh, today I think we're, we're going to be starting a, a short series looking at the world builder in Company of Heroes 3. I know there are a lot of uh, players out there who, who want to dabble in creating their own maps for the game, uh, and we thought we would create this tutorial series to help folks along. So if you've never created a map, this is probably the place to start. Um, Will, I think I'm just going to kind of hand things over to you, and, and, and you're going to walk us through uh, this series. Uh, so so if, if we're getting going, where do we start? Okay, well, first off, you will need to have the game installed. Um, when you have Company of Heroes 3 installed on Steam, you can right-click, uh, go to Properties, and then under Installed Files, you can then browse where the install location is. This is where the editor can be found. So just hit that button, and then down here, you will find the Essence Editor. If you right-click on this and just pin it to your taskbar so you don't have to keep on doing this every time, which is what I've done, you will have access to our editing tools. Okay, so that's just an easy way to have a shortcut so that we can just launch it right from the taskbar every Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah. So this takes a few moments just to load up. Here we are. Right, so I've already created a little test mod, but I'm going to start from scratch so that we're going through this at the exact same time together. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this would be... There's no sort of distinction here between I want to create a mod or I want to create a map. It's all done through the same process, yeah. Okay. So if I create a new mod here, I get to choose either an extension, game mode, a scenario, or a tuning pack. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of this 101, it is just going to be scenarios that I can cover because that's all I can cover. Um, so we'll select that and go to next, and then we're going to think of a name. So let's go for 101 map. As the scenario name. So clever. I love it. Oh, yeah. Um, and then as the display name, I'm going to go for our traditional style. So normally we would have our display names be in brackets the number of players that will be on the map and then a simple name. We can change this name later at any point, but I wanted to make a two versus two map. Uh, you can choose whatever size you want. Uh, we'll go through the process of how to do that in a moment. Um, but simply for the purposes of time and how long we've got to record these, a two versus two map seems like something that's feasible. Okay. Um, and, and sorry, what's the difference between the scenario name and the display name? Is the scenario name just like the file name? It is just the file name, yeah. Okay. The display name will be what you'll see in game. Uh, so you have two options um, here. I'm going to show you briefly what the options down here are, but we won't go for these ourselves. Doesn't mean you can't. So if you wanted to create a scenario based around our existing maps, you can select this uh, nodule here, and down here are a bunch of maps you can play with. We also have some gray block maps. So there's a two-player version, four-player version, a uh, six- and an eight-player version. What this will do is load you into a blank map, which has all the layers set up for you and is already a generic size for that number of players. So, honestly, for most people, I would recommend starting with a grey block map if it's your first time dabbling and you just want to spend some time digging through the tools. I'm going to go from the very start, though, to show you how to do everything, just in case that's the way you want to do it. Okay. But if you also wanted to make an edited version of our existing maps, then choose the ones that you want. So if I, if I don't like your previous work, I can go and, and, and play with it. Precisely. <laughs> yes, if you want to add one bridge and lots of rivers to Toronto, feel free. Um, so we're going to go with uh, the advanced, which is an empty crafted scenario. Um, it's just so I can show you this for the most part. So the scenario type will stick with multiplayer. Blueprints, we don't need to worry about. The chunk size is something I wouldn't recommend changing. It's set to 16 by default. It doesn't really matter right now what that does, but 16 is the way that all of our maps have been made, and it's what I would recommend. We then have terrain size and playable area. These are more important to get the scale of your map right. As we mentioned in previous live streams, scale is one of the things that almost all 
first time designers get wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very hard to tell the size of an infantryman or the size of a tank on a blank canvas because you've got very little to compare it against. Um, so what I'm going to do is go for my recommended size for a four player map. The terrain size is how big the entire map is, including out of bounds areas, areas that you can't play in. The playable area is the area within that where you are restricted to play. Um, so the terrain size always wants to be bigger. Funnily enough, the terrain size for a two versus two map is actually bang on to begin with. 640 by 640 is a nice healthy size. But I'm going to decrease the playable area slightly. I'm going to go down to uh, 448 by 448. I want a nice square map. Okay. And what would happen if, if we made the terrain size or even the playable area a little bit too, you know, larger or smaller than this for, let's say, a four-player map? Would that would that, that is know, be felt fine. in the gameplay? Uh, it will, yes. The larger you go, the more impact it's going to have on performance. But just for some reference, for those of you who are interested in making four versus four maps, uh, I would recommend probably around 880 is about as big as I'd go. Okay. There are some Co-1 maps back in the day that I think had 1,024 as their terrain size. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Montagis region was one of the largest maps out there. But performance is going to be impacted. Okay. Um, granted, the way that PC hardware goes, bigger maps may be a thing in the next few years because more people have you know, better hardware to play them on. But if you want something that everyone can play... Try and keep them a little smaller. Okay, sounds good. Uh, right, other than that, cell size is absolutely fine. The default height is where the terrain starts. I would actually recommend bumping that up to 20 because that means you can dig down or build mountains higher however you want to. Uh, that's just the default that it starts at. And then the number of starting positions here is basically how many HQs you want. So because I'm doing a 2v2 map, I want to set it to four and it will automatically place those for me so I don't have to go and do it myself. Okay. Once we've gotten that, just hit OK, and in we go. So yeah, the mod is the package that all these files are going to be in. So your mod name is what it's going to look like in your directory. So I'm going to keep it to 101 map. The display name, I want to keep the same. Description you can put in later, it's not too important. And then you've got to choose your location where you want to save it. I'm going to keep mine on my C drive. It doesn't really make any difference where it is, as long as it's not a cloud. Um, try and keep it on your your actual drive. Okay, so the the description is that's what what will be populated in the Steam Workshop, or does that come later? It would be, but okay. you can go and change that at any point. Okay. Um, so if you want to build something first and then describe what it's going to be, that's absolutely fine. Or if you have an idea of exactly what you want going in, feel free to fill it in. Okay. Uh, and here we go. And it will load up the editor. Now this can take a little while depending on your specs. Um, but bear with it. The most frequent cause of crashes in an editor like this is by trying to do too many things before it's finished loading. So okay. just, just give it a bit of breathing room. Uh, right, we're in. To begin with, this might not look like anything to, to most of you. This is um, what the editor looks like on a single screen. Each of these windows can be docked as they are now, where they're kind of locked in place. You can hold left click and drag them to move them wherever you want, however. So I can reposition these wherever I like, or I could even drag them off screen if you happen to have a two or even a three screen setup. Um, and you can have the render window, for example, completely off to the side. The render window is where you actually see your map. Whereas this scenario window is where all of your layers will be your asset explorer to the left here is where your mod files will be. So we're just going to make this smaller. You could close it entirely, but I don't mind. And then over to the right here, we've got our properties. This is going to be a very, very important window, so I make it a little bit wider. What I'm going to do to get us started is set up the editor itself how I would normally have it. So to begin with, I'm going to get rid of the playback window. I don't need it. That is just a way of pausing or playing whether assets are moving in your editor in real time. Like okay. if you have wind settings, it would make trees blow, that sort of thing. I don't need it. I want to get rid of the output. Don't need it. Error list. Don't plan to make any. And the object explorer I also don't actually use. 
You may want this because you can click and drag assets from here into it, but I'm gonna show you how to do it without that. So I'm left with my scenario and my render window, and that is the majority of my screen. That is absolutely fine. Um, so some other little things we should set up before we go too far. If you select by left-clicking any asset in the map, you'll get this widget that appears. And you'll also notice this transformation window that's appeared here. I want to keep that transformation window. It's a handy one, so I'm going to move it down there, and that's all good with me. Um, I am also just going to go into Tools and Settings and change a few very minor things. If you go down to the scenario settings here, this is everything scenario based. If you suffer from color blindness or any other visual impairment, you can change the colors of bounding boxes and widgets here. This is just a way to make it a little bit more accessible for you. But for the purposes of this tutorial, all I want to do is go down to overlay, camera mesh on top. I'm gonna to turn off. This will become clear in a couple of episodes time. Um, but it's something I wanted to do while I remember. But while you're also down here, you can also set some other overlays up here. So chunks, for example, I won't have on, but you might want to come back to this if you want to have a look at just how many chunks your map has. You want to do some measurements, for example, of you know, equal proportions on the map. You can use that layout. Well, you keep saying chunks as though I understand what that means. <laughs> I don't even know what a chunk is, I'll be honest. A, a chunk in this case is, um, I suppose, how many grid squares of measurement you have in your map. I see. And that will also be based on performance. So when you're working with tiles, which is our ground textures later, you can only have so many different textures per chunk. Mm -hmm. Earlier, when we set up the map, we set it to have um, 16 by 16 meter chunks, which is the setting I recommend that we don't change. Um, so that, that's what's determined the size. By having a smaller chunk size, we can have more textures per area, per chunk. By comparison, CO2 and CO1 both used 32 meters by 32 uh, chunk size. So they had... A, uh, a quarter of the map textures that we're able to have. Okay. Um, because there was only one chunk where we have four. Right. Um, but you don't necessarily want this overlay on all the time. Besides that, I think we're good. Let's close that and we're all good there. Right. So the next thing we need to do is set up some layers. If you're used to CO2 and even Co1's editor, you wouldn't have used layers much, if at all. But Co3's editor uses them a lot. The layers are here. They're these folders. This 101 map is the one that's set up immediately, and this contains all of your important gameplay stuff, markers that we'll go on to in a moment. But if you right-click on Scenario and hit Add, it lets you add a new layer. So I'm going to add a couple of layers in here. For example, Blockers. I'm also going to add in buildings and things like cover. So these are all these are all different layers that I will want to fill up with very specific things. It helps me keep track. So for example, all garrisonable structures will go in buildings, sandbags, tank traps, even things like wagons will mm -hmm. all go in cover. Um, so these are all important ways of, of helping you keep track. Right. So, we, so uh, as someone who, who does more work in something like Photoshop or Premiere, this feels familiar in terms of having a list of, of layers and assets that I can go back to and reference and manipulate. Yeah. Um, and, and I imagine you can set this up. I, I know you're setting up the, the will way right now, but I imagine every player can kind of customize this to their own preference. Yes, absolutely. And you don't have to use layers at all, really. You can have everything just kind of hapdash in one folder. Oh, it sounds like chaos. Um, <laughs> but yeah, bear in mind that by the time you spent maybe 20 or 30 hours on a map, you will have thousands of assets, splats, and splines all within this, this scenario. So keeping them organized is a great way to avoid a headache because if you encounter, say, a spline that isn't behaving properly and you want to get rid of it, you will have to go trawling through everything to find it. Whereas if I have a spline folder, everything will be in there and I won't have to worry. So speaking of, I'm adding another layer for splats and splines. They will be something we cover in our art tutorial later. I have so many questions about splats and splines. Yeah, they're basically textures that you can move. 
So okay. instead of it being painted hard into the terrain, you can move them around. And they're pre-made text cues as well, so they're they're really nice quality. Gotcha. Um, terrain modifiers as well. These will come into the gameplay tutorial a little bit later. Terrain modifiers would be things like um, adding train to the map, adding speed bonuses to your roads. Uh, territory is another very important one. We'll get onto that soon. And then last but not least for now, walls. So, these are the ones I would recommend you have. You can, by all means, have fewer or more. Mm -hmm. So we have blockers. That will be all of our movement, sight, and shot blockers that are hidden behind the scenes. Things like um, rocks that we have to cause gameplay to move around them or to block sight and stuff. That will all go in there. That will be what we'll use very early on, um, especially. Buildings will have all of our garrisons in them. Cover will have basic sandbags, tank traps, as I mentioned. Decals, or decals, if you're from this side of the pond. Um, these are splats and splines that are used in very specific ways. We'll get onto these later. They're, they're fun, but you don't want to be using them too early. Okay. Foliage will be trees, bushes, uh, hedgerows, everything like that. FX will be fire, smoke, fog that we add into the map in the finishing touches. Oob, or out of bounds, is everything that we put out of the playable area. Rocks will be, well, rocks. <laughs> um, splats will be the, the movable textures we mentioned earlier. Splines are a different type of splat. We'll get onto that at some point. Terrain modifiers, as mentioned, will be things like trenches or roads. Territory will be the individual flags you have um, within your map. And then walls will be tall, short walls, everything that's gameplay related. But because walls are built different to cover, we keep them in separate folders. Okay. Everything uh, seem okay so far? Yes, I was, I was going to ask. So if, if I set this up for one map, is there a way that I can sort of copy this template to my next map? Or would I have to set everything up from scratch again? Okay, thank you for asking that. So... It's, it's bizarre. I have made, I think I made 13 maps for the launch of the game, and I think I only did this process once. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can open two editors at once, um, because as soon as you load something up in it, it is op it's opened up a completely different uh, mod. So two editors at the same time is absolutely fine, as long as your PC can handle that. And you can just copy folders and drop them over into the next one. That's absolutely fine. Okay. There's even an option to paste in place. So if you copy anything from within a folder and you drop it onto another map, by pasting in place, it will drop it into the exact same location on that new map. Okay. So yes, you only have to do this process once. And from then on in, as long as the map size is about the same, just copy everything across. That's absolutely fine. Alternatively, if you wanted to... Start the process again, but with a different sized map. There is a tool for that. In Scenario and Resize, I won't do this because it will probably cause issues, uh, you can change the size of the map that you want. It's a bit of a finicky tool, so make sure you save before you do it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can make the map smaller or larger based on what you've, you've already got and what you're happy with. Just be aware that once you've got assets and textures all over your map, resizing it can cause problems. Okay. So it is best to get an idea of scale, and if you're happy with it, as early as possible, um, before you you know put twenty plus hours into your work. Okay. Okay. Right. Next important thing is going to be the widget and controlling things. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And you're just using the mouse scroll. I am using the mouse scroll, yeah. and you can also click in the middle mouse button if you want to move a little bit faster. That is how I usually move. Uh, the camera controls are very similar to what we have in-game, so holding Alt will allow you to rotate and pan the camera, mm -hmm. which is uh, nice and handy. I believe you can also use the arrow keys if you wanted to, but I have gotten so used to using my middle mouse button, that's all I really ever use for movement. Right. Um, Left-clicking on an asset in a map, like this, this null point here, uh, you will see the widget appear. So we have um, a red axis and a blue axis. This allows me to move if I left-click it. But there are other easy ways of doing this. For example, if I hold Control and Shift and I left-click, it will go to where my mouse is pointing. This is probably going to be your preferred way of moving things rather than either grabbing the box and dragging it 
or using the arrows. Okay, so basically once you have that thing selected, yeah. control shift, left click. And that's it, and it will move wherever you want it to. And you can do that with multiple things selected at once, which is great. Uh, otherwise, you can change what the widget does. So by default, pressing the W key will give you this movement node. So W will allow you to move um, on just a flat axis. If I hit E, alternatively, I can rotate sideways by clicking on these axes. And I could also rotate on a tilt if I wanted to. This isn't always recommended with gameplay assets because if this were my HQ, for example, it would be tilting into the terrain. <laughs> right. But the option is there. Um, and if I select R, I will get a resize tool. The resize tool has some amazing uses, but it also has some limitations. You don't want to be resizing anything that is interacted with in, in the map like short walls or buildings or basically anything that provides a very specific type of cover because the cover it provides will not scale with it. So if I take a very small wall, like a dry stone wall, and I rescale it to twice the size, infantry that move up against that wall will be below its height, so it will look like that it's sight and shot blocking, but it won't play that way because the, the asset is set up to be a short wall. Oh, okay, so so it's like properties won't necessarily correlate to the size of it. If exactly you manipulate right, it. yeah. The same with buildings. If I make a building say 50% larger than it actually is, the infantry will still be in the exact same positions they would be in on a normal scale building. So units won't be firing out of windows correctly or anything okay, like that. Okay, gotcha. What the scale tool is very useful for, however, is things like foliage and rocks. It's an easy way of making more natural looking environments by having variance between the different sizes of trees and bushes and so on. Either way, when you rescaled, the actual scale itself will be down here in transform. So I've set this to two times the scale. I'm just going to set it back to one. Um, so the W key, just for a refresher, will allow you to move on one plane. The E key will allow you to rotate and tilt. And the R key will allow you to rescale. If I uh, go back onto the W key where I'm moving things, I can also move them on a vertical axis by pressing H. Uh, the H is the height key. So it'll bring this vertical axis up, and I can move it up and down however I like. Okay, H for height makes it easy. H easier. for height. Um, you can also change the align lock, which is here, by pressing Q. So if I've got it selected, pressing Q will set it back to non-alignment, which is flat zero. I can also change it to surface, where if this is on a hill, it will start tilting as if it's on the hill. Uh, and I can just reset between those. Um, three. So terrain is on the terrain, surface is on a tilt if the terrain is tilting, and non is just a default. So if you have anything that's floating suddenly, just press the Q key on it and it will usually reset it back to where you want it. Another very, very, very helpful key is going to be the C key. So if I hold C and I left click and drag, it will duplicate something for me. So C for copy in this mm -hmm. case. Control Z will also undo. There's some things you don't want to copy. Right. If you wanted to copy the, the hard way, you could find an asset in the layers itself and you can either copy and then paste or you can just left click and drag and drop it on top of itself and it will duplicate it. But I wouldn't recommend we copy anything that we start with here because these are all very specific gameplay assets uh, and we could cause a bit of a crash. Okay. Okay. Uh Anything else we think we need to know about the widget before we carry on? No, I think that's pretty clear. Okay, sounds good. I'm just going to change my notes over. So, HQ markers to begin with. If we zoom in on what we've got here... Ooh, let me just rotate the camera for you. So, we have two pink markers, one for each player. These are SP starting points, and we have map entry points. You'll notice as I click through them, they have an owner already. This is something you want to make sure doesn't change, otherwise it will cause a crash, or you may end up with uh, a team that is missing a player. Okay. So I have a starting point that belongs to player one, and a map entry point that belongs to player one. That's perfect. So these two, if I bound box over them and drag them together, this is player one. On their team as well is player three. So they also have a starting position and a map entry point. Let's drag them out of the way of two. Uh, if I go over to... Whoop, 
the other side, it should be the same case over here. Player 2 has a starting point and a map entry point. Lovely. Let's get them out of the way. And player 4, same again. Lovely. Out of the way. Uh, what, what's the difference between starting point and entry point in terms of gameplay? So a starting point is going to be what your HQ spawns as. Okay. So it'll be the exact location where your HQ pops down. The map entry point is where units are going to spawn from off map. So we'll deal with these in a moment. We'll put them somewhere specific in the out of bounds. Okay. But you'll notice on all of our maps in the game at launch, if you spawn, say, SSF commandos off map, they will appear on a road or in a field behind your HQ somewhere and they will enter the map and come into play. Right. So that's what these are, these are for. You must have these in order to save, so don't delete them by accident. Okay. What I'm going to do is change these starting points, however. You'll notice it says uh, up in the properties over here, starting position, no HQ. This is something that uh, single player uses quite a lot, but is no good for us in multiplayer. So I'm going to, in the scenario here, left click and hold control and select all four of those starting positions. Go onto the three dots here to change the blueprint. And I'm going to change them to... Yeah, let's go starting position, shared territory. Oh, that's the wrong one. I am wrong. It's just starting position, I think. Yes, it is. There we go. So starting positions will spawn an actual USHQ. This will give you a better idea of scale and position, okay. things like that. So I'm going to just open this window up a little bit. So now we have a very blank map. We have four HQs, one for each player, and we have a map entry point for those players as well. Currently, though, the big problem is we have no scale to work with. Um, so, I am going to control S and save my map. I would recommend you do the same. Uh, where can I manually save? You can go to File and save up here as well. Okay, perfect. You'll notice as well, if I start moving some things around, a little asterisk will appear next to the scenario. Um, that means that there are unsaved changes. I would highly recommend you save often, mm -hmm. but there are some processes that might cause problems if you save during them, territory being one. If you're painting your territory, um, there's a very high chance that it will throw an error at you. Okay. So there are ways around that. We'll, we'll get to that point. Uh, but yeah, save as often as you can. Don't lose your work, especially if the editor is um, a little bit slower than ours is here that we're showing. If your, soft, uh, sorry, your hardware is, is struggling a little bit, save often, just in case. Okay, um, another little helpful tip is up here before we get started too deep on anything specific. So this taskbar up here has a load of toggle options, and these are all the different type of things you can have in your map. So for example, lock entity selection will lock all entities. So if I click that, I can't select these anymore. If I right click it, I can lock everything but these. So I will only be able to select these assets and nothing else in the map. Or if I just unlock all, I can select everything. This is a great way of helping you avoid accidentally selecting too many things. So when you've got loads of artwork like splats and splines on your map, mm -hmm. Using this, lock all but this, means I can only select assets and I can't accidentally grab hundreds of things underneath this. Very, very helpful way of maintaining control, um, especially as you get later into your maps and it gets a little bit more challenging. Yeah, I can see how that could be a problem down the road. Oh, yeah. Right. First things first, then, what we need to do is work on scale. So I am going to show you how to do a very basic spline layout. If we go on to splines and right-click the layer, I can add... And this allows you to add basically anything to the layer. But we're going to go for spline because it's a spline layer. That throws a little one out here. If I then right click on the spline, I can add a component. These components, we will go through most of these in time. But very simply, a wall component will create a wall. A strip component will create a texture. And these are the two that we want most. So I'm going to go for a strip component for now. That will give me this little component here. Right click on the component. Oh, no, sorry, don't even need to. It's over here. On the blueprint on the right side, it now asks me to put a spline in this, uh, sorry, a texture in the spline. So I'm going to go down to gray box and I'm going to grab the purple one because who doesn't like purple lines? <laughs> now, 
John's question before in do you have to do this every single time? The answer for these is also no. Once you've created a spline, hold, con uh, hold C and just copy to your heart's desire. Okay. So the process of creating a spline is something you'll probably only do once. I also need to unlock strip components so I can select these. So what I'm going to do is create a border for our playable area and I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy them. Um, so to begin with, I could do with a grid. So if I go on to scenarios and overlays, and let's think, actually this probably isn't the best grid for me. No, I'm gonna go for display chunks instead. There we go. The chunks are back. The chunks are back. So what I want to do is create a non-playable border in my map, very similar to how Co2 had it. If you look at Co2 and um, Co3's maps, you'll see there's a little area around the playable um, space that units will spawn in, but you can't interact with. Mm -hmm. We're going to create that. What I would normally recommend is that space should be 32 meters wide and no more than that. Um, because my chunks are all 16 meters, basically as long as my spline is within these two squares, the red border here being the complete out of bounds, then that is absolutely fine. If you hit space, you will notice that I now get four control nodes of this spline. By selecting one and dragging it, I make the spline longer. And I can also grab the middle ones to make it deform in its shape. Oh, I see, okay. So splines are all about controlling nodes. You can also add more nodes if you so wish by right clicking next to the furthest along and it will add an extra one for you. Uh, anyway, I'm just gonna undo all that because I want my lines to be perfectly straight. There we go. So what I'm going to do is extend this spline. I have to reselect sometimes. There we go. I'm going to drag it right to the very edge of the playable area. And you're doing that just by grabbing that last node? Grab that last node. You can grab multiple nodes at once as well if you wanted to. So I can do that. But yeah, otherwise you just grab the, the furthest node to the edge and you can drag them over. Okay. And because I'm lazy, I'm going to control C, copy that and just move it to the exact same place on the other side. I would say efficient, not lazy. Well, um, and then by holding shift, I can select two things at once in the map. So I've got both of these splines selected now. I'm going to hit E and I'm going to rotate. Oops, I forgot to copy them first. Uh, so hold C to create a copy. There we are. And then press E and rotate by 90 degrees. Oh, it was 89. This close to perfection, almost uh, there. It's so painful. There we go. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to go and drag it into the same position. So now I have a little bit of a better idea of scale. If I reset my camera, same as it is in game with uh, double tapping backspace, the purple line is now where all the gameplay is going to happen in my map. Um, so what I'm going to do now is grab each player's uh, map entry point and their HQ. I'm going to rotate them using the E key, not that way. Uh, I'm going to put them towards the back edge of the map where I want them. Okay. I might be getting ahead of myself, but the the, the splines that we've laid out here, mm -hmm. um, are they already set as out of bounds or do we have to... Add just a visual of... aid, that's okay. it. So, so we have to it's... add some properties to it later. We will, yes, okay. indeed. So remember as well, it's control shift left click to just snap things to where your cursor is and then the E key to rotate them. So this is whereabouts I want my HQs to be. I'm gonna have my players playing against each other on the lengthways. Mm -hmm. These little points that we've left behind, however, these are called starting territory team markers. This is gonna generate territory for the team. So I'm gonna drop this in between the two players. And same with over here, between the two players. And I'll ask the, the silly question now, but just because we're seeing US HQs doesn't mean that that's the default for the, for, for this one. When, when no, started. precisely, yeah. So th this is just a, a placeholder asset, so you have an idea of the direction they're facing, the scale that they'll be in-game. Okay. You'll notice that I've left about 16 meters behind both of the HQs. 
over here is about the same. This one being the exception, it's just nugs you out. Mm -hmm. So this will allow me to uh, have a little bit of room to maneuver behind them. And you'll notice that some of our HQs are bigger. The British and the Vermac HQs in game are um, longer and wider than the, the US ones. Okay. So now we have a bit of a better idea of scale. This is going to be the, the general size of our map. But let's give ourselves an even bigger helping hand. Let's draw some lines in here to give you some basically quadrants of the map. So if I grab this spline that I left here, I'm going to go and click on the component that was here, the, um, the purple uh, default road. Uh, I'm going to make a red one. I'm going to do the exact same thing I did before with the purple ones, however. I'm going to hit space, extendo, and extendo to make a nice straight line. And then this is going to go on the central point of my map. So if I count the chunks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's the 12 line. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Perfect. So this red line is now the center of our map that way. Okay. And, and I imagine the, these colors for these lines are arbitrary? They are very much so. And we will make them hidden so they don't appear in game a little bit further down the line. Right. This is just to help you deal with scale. Yep. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've copied that. I'm going to rotate it. You can also, if you don't want to do the manual way, down in the transformation at the bottom corner here, you can rotate in that section. So if I just type in... 90, it's done for me. Okay. So if you know exactly where you want to transform it or how you want to transform it, that's the way to do it. And then just count again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and it should be the same on both sides. So there we go. So now we have a map split into quadrants, which makes things a lot easier for designing areas or keeping things fair and balanced. You can right. add more if you want. Now I will because I want to make this map in a very specific way. So I'm going to clone this again, holding the C key. That sounded very nefarious when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm now going to rotate by 45. Um, I'm going to have to extend these lines, however. There we go. I'm going to copy that one more time, give it another 90, and there we have now the map is split into eight triangles. So... This is a nice, easy way to do a layout where you can think, right, I want this quadrant here, or this, this triangle here, to be mirrored with this one. I want this one to be mirrored with this one. And you can use this to help you lay out the territory or buildings, roads, anything like that. This is an easy way of doing it. You can also have non-mirrored layouts done this way. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I wanted to move this central line down here, and move these axes down here as well, I can have it so the quadrants in this area are smaller and the ones up here are bigger. In fact, I am going to do that. This this is calling to me. <laughs> so I'm thinking I'm going to have a urban area in the small section down here and a rural area in the larger section up here. Okay. So that should work nicely, as long as I remember that this red line down the center is a fair distance between the players. All I would need to do really to catch up is move the HQs where I want them so that they're also pretty fair and balanced. So so I, I know our, our focus with this series is really on how to use the, the, the world builder tool, but but I am kind of curious about the design intent here. Would, would it make sense to have some sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, pie shaped layout like this every time I'm doing a map or would it make more sense sometimes to use like a grid or is this really just up to... Uh, the player themselves in, in terms of like what makes sense to them and how they want to lay things out. Yeah, so th this is entirely up to you. Um, you will notice that some maps from Co 1, Co 2 will follow a very generic layout. Um, in fact, I have some images to show you an example. The way that this is laid out at the moment is what I call a butterfly map. A butterfly map has a very strict central line and what happens on either side of that central line is mirrored. So what is happening here will be the same here. What's happening here will be the same here. But you could do it instead in a spiral formation. You can have a rotation to your map. 
So if I load up this minimap of Angerville back in Co1, you'll notice that while this map does have a central line, the central line runs through here. So essentially where this road is, it cuts through here. It isn't balanced in the same way as the butterfly map is. The fuel point and munitions point is to the player's left. Whereas on this side, it's on this side. So it rotates clockwise. I see, yeah. And you'll see the territory points, so two strategic points, three strategic points, they all flow clockwise. So if you want to have a nice competitive map, for example, this is a great layout to start with. It encourages the player to move in one direction because they've got safer resources, but they've got higher resources if they go counterclockwise. Right. With more risk. So this is an, uh, just a nice example of a, of a spiral layout. But the version that we're going to do, the, the layout that we're going to go for, uh, is going to be more like this one. So this is a perfect bisected butterfly map. You can draw a central line between the two players, and everything on the left or right of that central line is balanced and fair. So you've got 10 munitions in the top corners, 10 fuel in the bottom corners, and then everything in between the players is fair and simple. The reason why I'm going for this layout is because it's the easiest. Um, especially when you're making your first map, you're going to make mistakes. So the, mm -hmm. the very least we can do is make the layout of the map as mirrored as possible, just to make it simple. Okay. I, I imagine this will help with like further playtesting down the road as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that you can't make butterfly maps like this feel natural. Like you can have a balanced map without both sides of it looking the exact same. And I'll, I'll show you the trip, the, uh, uh, tricks and techniques that I've got um, a little bit further in once we get to the art and the design stage of all the assets. But for now, let's just keep the notion that this is going to be a balanced map with a bisector line. Um, right. Next thing we need to sort out is making sure this is playable and testable. So I am going to save this and no errors are going to pop up, which is great. What I'm now going to do is set the gameplay camera. Now, this might seem like an odd thing to do so early, but I usually set the camera up first because the map I design is going to be based around the default camera. I know some players might immediately load into maps and set their camera so that their HQ is the closest to them, so they have the biggest field of view. But the majority of our players don't. The majority of our players will play from the default camera. So what you want to do is while you have nothing selected and you've got properties open, go to the angle. Let's say, for example, I hit 90 and I hit enter and then uh, override global settings needs to be ticked. Every time I reset my camera, it will default to whatever that angle is. This looks pretty good to me. Uh, it's obviously favoring these two players over here, mm -hmm. but in terms of a natural angle, this is pretty good. I might maybe adjust it a little further. Oh, very, very different. Uh, let's go back a bit. Let's try 40. Wild. Uh, let's try and think. Let's go into the negatives, maybe. Oh, I see. So so this is sort of set, setting like the default rotation. Of the it map. is, yeah. It's, <clears> this <throat> is the rotation. This is the one I want. This is perfect. So negative 40 is the way that my, my camera will look in-game. Um, so I have the urban area is now at the top and the rural area will be the bottom, which is perfect. Okay. What I'd recommend as well is if you're unsure what to do with your camera angle, I would usually suggest that if you have any high ground in your map, have it towards the top of the screen. So it looks like the player is moving uphill as they're looking in the default angle. So down here will be my lowland with the, the rural area. And then up here will be a urban area up on a hill. For okay. example, and, and so are, are we setting camera height, uh, like default camera height, a little bit later, or you can set it here if you want. Okay, but this doesn't always necessarily work. This is more for what's in the editor. It will always default to what we have set up in the game as gotcha. the default camera. Yeah, the camera mesh is something you can set yourself a little bit later. We'll get onto that in another episode. Um, but the camera mesh is the the flow that the camera will take over hills and bumps and into rivers and canyons, that sort of thing. It's an important step, but we don't need to worry about it right now. Um, some other final steps I suppose we should take is setting up our actual playable area. 
Mm -hmm. So we've put in this spline here to show where we want the playable area to end, but we haven't actually painted it. So we need this tool over here. This is called the interactivity map. Once you select it, you'll notice that everything goes a little bit of a darker shade of gray. And it's because we're painting something and it's a very bright color. So the target here is uh, essentially saying, I want this area to be out of bounds. If I just left click and drag here, you'll see this, this blue that's appeared. So this is an area that players can no longer enter under any circumstances. So what I'm gonna do is change this to be square, make the size of it 32 because our outer bounds is 32 meters wide. And I'm just gonna paint along that line and fill it all in. Now I won't do all this on camera because it's a little monotonous, <laughs> but you may be wondering why I've gone for a very generic square shape. And it's because it's easy to do that. If mm -hmm. I had diagonals, if I cut the corners off, for example, I would have to go in and do it with this tool and just clean everything up. Uh, while we've got the painter tool up, this is the first time you would have seen it. You've got a few options here I'll quickly cover. Uh, the, the, the flood fill will do as it did in MS Paint all those, all those years ago, then you last used it. This will fill the entire area, which I don't want to do. But I can do a sample if I want, if I'm using multiple different interactivity layers, which we won't do in multiplayer. That's a single player thing only. I can select it and it will pick target one. But um, you also have a right mouse button option as well. So you can use your left and your right mouse at the same time. If I change my right mouse to square, but I, um, I want to make sure instead that I am deleting. Oh yeah, so if the target is set to zero, if I right click, it will delete everything I painted. Oh, that's super handy. Okay, so you can clean up your mistakes as you go. Absolutely, yeah. So if I left click, I can just paint and drag. And if I make any mistakes wildly like that, I just right click and get rid of them. Easy okay. peasy. So I won't do this on camera, but fill the entire map up, uh, at least the out of bounds beyond this purple line with this uh, non-interactive zone. And you will end up with um, the purple area being a border in game. So everything beyond here, you won't be able to get units um, into it, but you can get units out of it. This is the, the reason why we do it. Okay, so uh, just quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, th does it make sense to keep the out of bounds um, painted borders like that as simple as possible? Or or is there any cause or any reason why I would maybe tweak them a little bit or, or make them, you know, different shapes or, or uh, have different contours to the out of bounds area? Yes. Um, or does that cause problems down the road? It, it can, but um, it's entirely up to how much work you want to put into it. Okay. The more... Out there you go, let's say for example, I just add a nice curve like this, yep. that is absolutely fine. Okay. There are, however, bugs. If your camera is tracing along this edge, the more notches that you find in it, the more likely your camera is to get stuck. I see. So creating wild shapes like this isn't recommended because your okay. camera can get stuck in here and it's difficult to get it out sometimes. Okay, so as I'm getting started, I should probably keep it simple. Yeah, for, for now especially. And similarly, if you don't fill in the corners entirely all the way up to the edge of the, the uh, outer bounds, your camera can also get stuck in here. Mm -hmm. So make sure you fill everything in. Okay. Um, that is just something to keep in mind as you're going around, which is why I tend to make the tool 32 meters the exact size that I want, so I'm less likely to leave gaps behind um, against the out of bounds edge. Okay, good to know. Uh, right. Uh, so, a couple of other little things that might help you further on the way. Um, if you select default mode over here, your camera, so your your cursor will go back to the default mode of the tool that you have open. So, if I I have selected just a normal layout and I hit uh, default mode, I can use my cursor as normal. This won't really make much of a difference for now, but it will do later and I'll show you things like the in-pass map or the path map. Um, so also remember if your camera is looking a little weird or your cursor is looking odd, just go back to default mode here and it should revert it. Um, besides that, we also have regenerate all, which is a little button on the top of the taskbar here. If you are looking at an odd view uh, and the editor for whatever reason isn't updating, regenerate all takes a moment, but it will just regenerate everything in the map from scratch. Um, always worth doing this before you export your map. 
um, just to make sure that everything is where it should be. Mm -hmm. And what else have we got? Uh, oh yeah, to, for visibility, things like that, if you go into scenario, you can choose to hide things, many, many things. For example, if I want to hide the fog, I can just select that option. This is more for if you're doing the design and you don't want your atmosphere to impede. We haven't really got an atmosphere loaded on this map yet, so it doesn't really matter. But things like FX, grass, um, water, you can hide or reveal things here. So just remember that under scenario, you have an option to to clarify your view, just in case there's too many things happening on screen at once, that this is where you find everything. Okay, so you could isolate specific elements if you really need to remove all distractions. Yes, indeed. Uh, and then one final big step before we get to essentially the play test phase. I wanted to make sure that in this first episode, we can get to a point where you can save it and play test it, and then you don't necessarily have to wait for me. Uh, if you go on to this shield up here, it's called the territory map. This isn't important until we have loads of territory points in, but what you may have found in moving your territory, uh, sorry, your um, starting positions for your HQs, you may have found that they are no longer within the right side of their territory, and it will throw an error if they aren't. So if this uh, HQ marker, in fact, I might as well just grab him. Let's move him over to the wrong side. If I now try and save... Oh, it has actually saved without an error, but in-game, this player will not be in territory they can use. Okay. So they probably won't be allowed to build any units. So what you want to make sure is, before you start playtesting on the territory layout, that players are in the right side. And if they're not, if you've moved everything around and these are completely off, the red and the blue just don't correlate to anything anymore, you just hit this button on the top called Initialize Voronoi. And what it will do is reset um, you only want to do this in the early stages. If you start hand painting territory, never press this button okay. because it will reset everything. All right. Um, but make sure you click this and then what you can do is save peacefully. How do I check that the HQs are in the correct territory? So, uh, over here, we have some settings overlay flash unconnected and flash nil. If I were to move all of my... Uh, HQs out. So let's say I move them over here and I try and save. Ah, we have an error. So I don't want to save. I want to see my error. Multiple sector creating entities found in sector two. If I open up the territory, this one has nobody in it. Mm -hmm. If this territory were disconnected as well, let's say for example, I just make a bigger brush and I just cleave a line through. You'll notice that this is flashing because it's now out of bounds or it's not connected to anything in particular. Oh, I see. Okay. And the same goes for territories besides this HQ territory. If territories were not connected to the rest of the map, they would also be flashing right now because we've set the overlay to flash unconnected. Okay. So let's take all those steps back. We've got them where we want them. Uh, I also I forgot to put this back. So these map entry points, now that we've got the out of bounds, can now live... Oops, wrong person. They can now live out of bounds. I, I also didn't explain what I was just doing there. If you have multiple things selected on top of each other, by left-clicking in the same place, you will filter through them. So I now have the uh, map entry point selected, but if I clicked again, I would have had the HQ selected. Okay, so you have, if you have a bunch of stuff stacked on top of each other, you'll just cycle through them like yep. that. Okay. Absolutely. So That's I'm going to move these into the out of bounds, so beyond the purple line, into the non-interactive zone we've painted. And these units will, whenever you spawn, say, like I said, SSF commandos, they will spawn in this off-map area and they will end the map where you told them to. Right, that is looking good, ready to save. And then the final step for getting ready to playtest is over up on build. So select build, build mod. It will burn everything. If there's any errors, this is where they'd probably appear. Uh, what, what kind of typical errors might we see here? Mostly territory, to okay. be honest. Territory is the thing that breaks the most. Uh, but thankfully, by doing those same checkboxes to make things flash if they're unconnected, mm -hmm. it's an easy way of staying on top. Okay. Once it's all burnt, then I believe it should now be in-game. So let's give it a little test. So if I open up Steam and I go and play, 
this might take a few moments. Okay, and I imagine this will live in your mod tab in game. It will. Okay, and I'll show you where that is. Perfect. Any other questions, John? Before we uh, wrap up, I'm sure I'll have a million more as we go. Uh, but everything's pretty clear so far. Uh, we're, we're not getting too too advanced just yet. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious if, if there are any other sort of um, hurdles that players might encounter as they kind of go through these first few steps with the world builder, anything that maybe you encountered uh, when you started using the tool. Hmm. All right, here it is, just, just before I answer that question. So, yep, in modded, here is our map. We can select that, and we can go and play it. Okay, there we go. So any of the hurdles, honestly, the, the widget is probably the one that gets people the first time. It takes a little bit of getting used to having to cycle between W, E and R to do what you want with the assets in your map can take a bit of getting used to. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, once you've gotten a handle of those three and you get used to copying things rather than creating new splats and splines from new, you save so much time. Um, when we get onto some of the art steps, I'll show you the, the most efficient ways I know of really dressing your map quickly, um, making it look pretty without too much effort. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, everyone's experience is going to be different. Some people may trip up on things that I I didn't. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we if we encounter those problems, we have our public Discord. Please do feel free to ask questions anytime. I, yeah, I, I do I think, frequent it. I think another thing we can shout out, and we'll link it in the um, video description, is the uh, Knowledge Center on, on our website, uh, community.companyofheroes.com, um, and that has a bunch of great articles um, and, and uh, wikis on how to use the tools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, so. Let's just show an example. I'm going to choose the SF and spawn in a weasel. Ah, oh, and he's appeared behind my HQ. Little man. So proud. <laughs> uh, you'll notice as well if I go out here, this this uh, black and white dotted line should be here on purple. But I haven't finished painting it yet. If I go over to the other side of the map, for example, over here, there we are. Black and white dotted line lines up nicely with the out of bounds that we drew in with splines. Right, okay. So that is what you're looking for. That will stop your units from going beyond that playable area. It'll disable it. Uh, this is actually where we stopped uh, painting. So what you have is your camera can't get beyond this black and white line. Um, and that means everything beyond this red line is completely visual. Like there's no gameplay that can impact here. Okay. Units will spawn within this area, but very few things can impact it. Artillery can miss, for example, and land out here. So we have playable space, soft map edge, and out of bounds. And we'll do more with those when we get to the art stage of okay. time. Uh, so so w is there anything else that you would want to test here before you move on to, the, to finishing, uh, you know, painting the out of bounds area? Yeah, so um, the main thing to make sure is that your players are on the same team. Um, so for example, my HQ and my allies HQ are on the same side of the map and we can see each other. I can't see my enemy, which mm -hmm. is a good sign. Um, but this is the best thing to test. If you start adding things like bunkers later, we'll show you how. Uh, make sure that all the bunkers that you spawn to protect your HQ area also belong to the right player and the right team. That can okay. be awkward, getting trapped into your HQ sector by your enemy's bunkers. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, feel free to just play around the map. It is the same as normal gameplay. And everything that you've put in it will be here. Um, once you start getting territory laid out and cover laid out, the best thing to do is go in and play and see if the scale feels right. For example, like right now, because this is a blank canvas, this feels pretty big to me. But if I get a weasel and I drive to the, the halfway line, I bet it will only take him about 10 seconds to get there. Right, yeah. I, I imagine once we start to fill this in, it'll feel a little bit more um, to scale, I suppose. Yes. I might be wrong with 10 seconds. It might be about 20 seconds, because he's not on a road. Oh, oh right. lots of enemy. But yeah, so for a light vehicle like this, this map is only about 30, 40 seconds wide in terms of movement, which is pretty good, pretty healthy. Uh, that's not to say you can't make changes. Of course you can. You can go in and rescale if you want. Um, but 
this is where I would I would leave our first step. This is should be enough to get you up and running. And then next time we will start moving on to terrain and cover all the gameplay elements that you'll be used to seeing in maps. We'll get those laid out. Okay, that's amazing. This is a, a terrific introduction, Will. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It's almost like you were an educator in a previous lifetime. <laughs> um, so, so thanks for for making everything so clear and easy to understand. Um, so, like Will said, folks, we'll be back with episode two very, very soon. Um, and for everything else, you can find links in the video description. Uh, so, thanks so much, Will. My absolute pleasure. <laughs>